in the valley, in the community. So I see a lot of um, the gamut of breast disease. So we're going to move from the bottom discussion to the top discussion because UOB guides end up being the ones who are primarily taking care of women's breasts. Screening, managing them for their, their lumps and bumps and how to deal with that. And I don't know how much formal training is ever given, even to the breast cancer surgeons. We don't get a lot of formal training in benign disease. A lot of it is uh, learn on the job. So hopefully this will be a good overview with what is uh, known, but also what is changed in the world of breast benign disease. Um, so uh, that's my disclosure. I have spoken for one of the um, genomic uh, testing companies in the past. So what we're going to go through is basically everything. So from risk assessment and a bit of genetic testing, which I know I'm not needing to, to preach to you about uh, genetic testing so much. Um, breast density, breast pain, which is probably your number one breast complaint, um, breast lump, how to manage that, the newer things in mastitis and abscess, nipple discharge, and then a lot of the not the benign pathology. Every every week, probably, I get a text from one of the local gynecologists about um, what to do for this or that diagnosis on a core biopsy. Do they need a surgery? Um, do they really need a surgery? Should they see you? Um, so those kinds of uh, pathologists, pathologies are always a little bit challenging sometimes when they get more convoluted with a number of words that are added. So the, the risk of breast cancer, the most obvious that I tell my patients is being a woman and aging, two things you cannot change. Certainly men get breast cancer and um, it's about 1% of all breast cancer is in men. Um, but the majority will be in an older woman, and about 79% of breast cancer is going to be in a woman over 50. Personal history is certainly a risk factor, and so are the more abnormal biopsies of atypia and LCIS, or lobular carcinoma in situ. Family history will be a risk factor, but so many women tell us, you know, I'm the first person with breast cancer in the family. Um, exposure to hormones for a long period of time, so early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity, long duration greater than 10 years of hormone replacement therapy combination. We know early shorter doses and estrogen alone is, however, very safe and sometimes necessary. Other lifestyle modifications that we see more and more related to the risk of breast cancer include obesity, alcohol, and a sedentary lifestyle as well as smoking. Breast density. We'll get into that a tiny bit on is another risk factor for breast cancer as well as genetic risk. So uh, many of you have known about the Gale model, which is an easy to use online application where you plug in various features about a woman's age, their family history, their first degree family history, a little bit about their hormonal exposure um, and their ethnicity. But the problem with this Gale model is it only looks at first degree family history. So if you have a woman whose father's sister and mother had breast cancer, the Gale model will miss that. It doesn't discriminate early age breast cancer. So you can have a, a sister with breast cancer at 80 versus a sister with breast cancer at 40. That'll make a big difference on this model and uh, on the actual risk that a woman has with breast cancer. Also does not look at hormonal exposure or ovarian cancer history. What I like to use, and I try to encourage my, my gynecologists to download in their own offices, is this risk evaluator called the Tyrocusic model. This is a free online um, evaluator. You can download it for your own offices. So if you're in the Cedars network, sometimes IT needs to come in and, and allow this to download to happen, but it, it's an easy thing to do. Some, some gynecologists want to be really hands-on for their patients and help them with their risk. Um, but a bigger reason to do this is because you need to get that authorization for your MRI, right? So you're trying to get a woman with a concern about a breast issue. She wants an MRI or you want her to get an MRI and some reason or other insurance is declining it. This is a tool that allows you to calculate the risk of uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer and then submit that to the, your, and your, and put that into your note and then show that yes, indeed, this patient does have a breast cancer risk. This is what the actual tool looks like. Um, I'll go through that really briefly. I know at a glance, it looks like a lot of information, but if you go through it one by one, it takes about two minutes to fill out. Um, for my intake forms, I have patients fill out the very, the, you know, the normal, the GP questions, but also um, we look at their family history and the number of female relatives. 
So at the top, you'll see women's age and then menarche and their height and weight because body mass index does in, uh, matter for breast cancer risk. The parity, the age at first childbirth. So we know having a child at a younger age is actually protective of breast cancer, whereas help, having a child in their late 30s and older is a, actually a risk factor for breast cancer. Whether or not they've had a prior biopsy and what that biopsy may have shown, whether they're pre or perimenopausal, the age of menopause, their mammographic density has recently been added to the tyrochesic modeling. We know again, and I'll explain a little bit more, that breast density is an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, and then it goes into mother, sister, but also female and uh, uh, dad side, so paternal, uh, paternal relatives. It goes into whether or not genetic testing has been in, in, performed in the past. Um, and then how much hormonal exposure of combination hormone therapy they've had. Then you click the button, calculate risk, and you get this nice printout of a pedigree and their actual risk. So it starts, it goes up to the age of 85 um, and however old the patient is, and it'll look at the average population, the lifetime population risk in this group of women at this age in her lifespan is 12%, but for her it's 14%. Now that's not technically considered a high enough risk to really routinely want an MRI, but as you can see, you get a lot of information you can copy and paste this into your CS link note. You can print it and give it to your patients. Some patients really like that. They like to know their risk isn't that high. When it's very high though, when the risk calculates out to over 40%, I find it's not necessarily the best thing to give to a patient. They don't need to live with that fear either. Um, so for genetic testing, moving from the regular calculation to the actual genetics, um, only about 10% of breast cancer is going to be genetic. The rest is going to be sporadic or familial. Um, as you all know, there's many more genes besides the, the BRCA1 and 2 genes that we care about in terms of breast cancer along the DNA double strand break repair pathway. So um, certainly we are wanting to look at a whole panel of genes whenever there's someone with a higher risk. Um, but I, what I find very curious though is still sometimes the, even having a known mutation, we're not always doing the right screening for patients. It broke my heart about a couple years ago when I had a 30 year old come to me with a known BRCA mutation and then a, a, a palpable breast cancer found to have bilateral breast cancer. That young woman with known BRCA mutation died this year. And um, it's such a hard thing to handle because we could have saved her had she been screened properly. She hadn't been getting any breast screening. Her gynecologist had her undergo genetic testing for family history. She carried a BRCA1 mutation, but her breasts were not screened. Um, what we wanna do is start not mammograms before age 30, but MRIs starting at age 25 for the BRCA1 and 2 gene carriers. The mammogram should start at age 30. The reason to not start it earlier is there's data showing starting mammography at a much earlier age will actually lead to increased, um, actual increased cancers, the radiation exposure will cause um, some problems for the patient um, over time. We also talk about risk-reducing mastectomy and as well risk-reducing agents such as tamoxifen for our younger patients, but many of them choose not to, to go that route. Um, the other breast cancer genes that we care about, BRCA1 and 2, P10, TP53, CDH1, more commonly we see ATM, CHECK2, and PALB2. The guidelines for each of these continue to evolve you know, we started looking at this about seven or eight years ago. Um, and then at each year we get more and more data about what to do, what are the guidelines? So the, the rules for screening are actually different for each gene and each actual gene mutation. Um, so it's not always gonna be uh, doing a, an MRI starting at age 25 for say a CHECK2 mutation. It's actually going to be quite tailored and different. So that's that's where the nitty gritty needs to come into place with our genetic counselors and geneticists. Um, early on, we did a, a study looking at all of our patients who tested for BRCA1 and 2. And so they, they qualified, they were high risk to qualify for the testing, not necessarily all had cancer. We took them, we went back and looked at those um, that tested negative or that who qualified for the BRCA patient uh, 1 and 2 testing. And we retested them for a panel of genes and we doubled our mutation pickup. So we really know that 
that doing these extended panels of testing, looking at additional genes will pick up so many more um, actionable mutations, meaning you can increase the screening, you can evaluate for other types of cancers. So we're really excited about the ability to continue the um, extended panel testing for genetics in terms of breast cancer. In addition, obviously, we can screen for colon, pancreatic, and ovarian cancers, um, as you all know. All right, the next risk we want to talk about, which is an everyday thing you'll see in a regular report of every mammogram, and it became law in California years ago that a mammography a report must include breast density and a caution about increased density. The, the, the term density, especially density related to the breast, is often misused. Many, many, um, I've seen this from gynecologists as well. Many times gynecologists will say your breast is dense. Because actually it's not dense, but it's lumpy or it's firm or it's a difficult exam. That's a clinical evaluation. That's not a diagnosis of density. The diagnosis of density actually comes from the finding on a mammogram, whether or not the mammogram is white. And that's dense white comes from glandular tissue and connective tissue versus gray and fatty. So, on the left, we have a really easy to see through breast on the right. You have a, a very dense breast and the reason that matters is there's an increased risk of breast cancer in women with that right sided mammogram. But what does it mean to have dense breasts and just going back to the, the concept of the palpable versus not palpable. So, a woman can have a dense breast, but still have a very easy breast exam and vice versa. Um, so, a woman can have a very fatty breast on mammogram, but have a very difficult breast exam and be full of lumps and have a very firm uh, texture of tissue. But what it means is actually we're looking at a lot more connective tissue and ductal elements as well as stroma versus fatty tissue and less connective tissue. The categories of density look go from left to right. So fatty is that really nice see through breast on mammogram scattered fibroglandular density. Those are also the, the actual words you'll see on that mammogram report. Heterogeneously dense means the breast is about 50% dense or more. And extremely dense is when the breast is 75% dense or more. Um, so half of us women will have heterogeneously dense and extremely dense breasts. The other half of us will have what's called not dense breasts or fatty and scattered fibroglandular breasts. So it's totally normal. It's, a, it's developmental and what determines breast density, a lot of it is age, but so much more of it is going to be genetic. Um, things that women cannot change. Menopausal status, weight, and parity account for a small part of breast density, but the rest is going to be also due to sometimes hormone replacement therapy. And actually, there's some data showing that tamoxifen um, in some women can decrease breast density, um, as well as diet has been associated with breast density. But the reason to care. Obviously, we can we can care because we can't find cancer. So on the left mammogram, you can see that big white spiculated mass. So cancer shows up white on a mammogram. And on the dense breast, you can hardly see the drawn in cancer I drew there because it's so white. We can actually not easily find cancer on mammogram, but that's not the only reason. And this is where we've got a double edged sword. It's not only difficult to find cancer, but the dense stroma actually increases the risk of breast cancer. Um, so there's something within the stromal milieu and the, the cellular components that are allowing for breast cancers to develop. There's been numerous studies showing basically a quadrupling of breast cancer risk in women with increased breast density. Um, so if we look at what to do about it, you know, this is what our poor patients get stuck with. They get this letter you guys have to explain what that density means and then figure out, okay, now what? So they get this letter, they've got a dense breast, what are we supposed to do? Luckily, we now have 3D mammography or tubal synthesis, but also for some people with increased risk, I consider adding screening breast ultrasound, which is looking at the whole breast or MRI even for my higher risk patients. Um, so when we're looking at 3D and tumor synthesis, and hopefully you've had um, some, some closer discussions with your radiologist about why this technology is so useful. I had one radiologist explain to me 
Um, you know, 2D is like looking at this loaf of bread. You kind of see raisins on the outside, but you don't know if there's nuts on the inside. You slice the bread up and then you can see whether or not there's nuts. Um, so 3D really has like a, a whole um, way of scanning through the breast. You get almost a video through the breast, through the parenchyma. You can really tell if that spot that you see in the box there is something real or if it just spreads out and is not, is just overlapping dense tissue. We can also see something hidden within the density is actually a speculated mass on 3D. So 3D has really, really improved the ability to diagnose and identify cancers, especially in women with increased dense breasts. One of the landmark studies was almost about half a million exams looking at the benefit of 3D mammography. And they looked at the recall rate, meaning, you know, your mammogram's abnormal, it's a virus zero, you have to come back for additional imaging versus the biopsy rate and the cancer detection rate. And in that landmark study, that's the bottom one here, but additional studies showed an increase in cancer detection by almost 30% with a decrease in the false positive, meaning the false alarm, the come back and maybe we need to do a biopsy or come back, we need additional imaging. So it's, it's really beneficial. And generally in the beginning, we saw a big learning curve so if you're going to go out into practice in a setting where they're just adopting the 3D imaging because that's still happening, it's certainly not widespread everywhere, you're going to see your radiologists have a learning curve. They don't exactly know how to read the new imaging as well, and they're going to do a lot of callbacks. That learning curve goes away after about six months to a year, and you see a really a, a better pickup of cancers and a decrease in the uh, false calls. Um, okay, so tomosynthesis or 3D mammography really will lower the recall and increase the detection of invasive cancers. Um, in the beginning, before we had this as a routine, many uh, patients would say, well, I had a 2D this year. Do I need to now get a 3D? I always tell them, no, we don't want to radiate your breasts again this year. If anything, we can add screening ultrasound this year and next year we'll plan on doing that 3D imaging. Um, so screening ultrasound is a great way to pick things up, but the studies on this are a little bit um, complicated. When we can certainly pick up more cancers with the screening ultrasound, often these cancers are um, very low grade and not as aggressive, which is fine because they'll still be there uh, to pick up no matter what. They don't typically go away, um, but there's also false positive rate. Same thing with MRI. We see a lot of background noise sometimes, a lot of unnecessary workups, but it's it's a, so it's a it's a big discussion to have with patients before adding all these additional images and the pros and cons of that. Okay, so moving on to more common breast issues. So breast pain, I think, is 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 always a sticking point, right? I mean, I see so much breast pain in my practice, um, but someone needs to see breast pain, and, I, and unfortunately, it's the gynecologists and the obstetricians who are really um, the, the first barrier to, to dealing with patients and their breast pain. Um, and it's very common. Typically, we try to chalk it up to hormonal. And, and certainly, that is um, one of the most common reasons. But it does affect majority of women at some point in their life. And many of them will show up to your office and say, what do I do about this? I've never had this before. It's only in one breast. Why is that? Um, so the main questions you'll ask, or is it cyclical or non-cyclical, obviously? Is it time with your menstrual cycle? Is it right before your period? And then uh, we wanna figure out, is this hormone or is there some other cause? But truly breast pain can be associated with malignancy. We always say, oh, breast pain isn't, isn't associated to cancer, but I certainly, I've seen it enough times to say, no, actually breast cancer can lead to a pain. Typically, I see that pain when the malignancy is sitting on the chest wall and pushing against the pec muscle. Sometimes it can be near the skin, but other times, just recently, I had in my office a patient with a throbbing breast pain and her breast cancer was picked up within the center of her breast, not pushing on the muscle, not near the skin, but she knew there was some discomfort there. She couldn't feel a lump. She only had discomfort. So we can't ignore breast pain, and that's the challenge that we have, right? What, do we, what, is, what are we gonna do about it? How do we make sure patients have some peace of mind? You know, if they're very young, you might not wanna get diagnostic imaging, but bring them back soon to in about a three month period to see what to do. Um, but ideally it's nice to find things like cysts, 
as an explanation or other medications that may be on as an explanation, but certainly don't make them wean off caffeine and certainly not been shown to be a cause of breast pain. They, if they're taking excessive doses of caffeine, more than five cups a day of coffee, that might be something to think about, but a few cups of coffee a day will not be a benefit in reducing just to get rid of their breast pain. The main things are going to be, and actually with COVID, we saw this a lot more, um, stress management and bra support. So many people were working from home. My patients stopped wearing their bras and they came to me with breast pain. Uh, it seems like an obvious thing, but it, it wasn't obvious to these women. So um, bra support is really important. Then I try the low carb diet uh, to try to help get off some extra fluid that they're carrying on. The other interventions that I find are very useful would be evening primrose oil vitamin E, flaxseed, um, topical NSAIDs like dicofenac can, can be used. Most women choose not to spread something all over their breast, but if they're really at, a, at odds end, this is something that can be applied. Um, obviously, oral NSAIDs are useful. Um, now, danazole, bromocryptine, and tamoxifen all have side effects. Danazole has a side effect of um, virilization, hair growth, it's an androgen. Bromocryptine can have other side effects and tamoxifen can have side effects. So each of those things really need to be discussed with patients about how, how severe is their pain? Have they tried everything? Have they waited a few months to see if their pain has come and gone? I have found very few patients really actually want to take a medication, but sometimes it's helpful to tell them, well, there is medication that we can prescribe with these side effects if it keeps going. And that alone sometimes is enough to let the pain come and go. Okay, so the differential now for um, lump, we're going to move to lump now, um, are all of the things written here, obviously cancer, but there's a number of different benign conditions. Um, the workup for that lump is going to be um, starting under age 30. We don't want to add mammograms, but we do want to start with ultrasounds. Um, from 30 to 60, we're going to think about adding the mammogram with the ultrasound for a palpable lump or an area of concern. Greater than 60, I'm very concerned about a new lump. Women at this point in time often know their breasts quite well. If they're feeling something new, you must listen to them and don't just say a normal imaging is good enough. Um, if we're worried about some cellulitis, I typically prescribe antibiotics while waiting for the diagnostic imaging. Um, and all, often, if there is a true mastitis, we're going to look at what kinds of bugs to cover for. Um, obviously, I, I, you guys are all well aware of what medications are safe in nursing. I tend to go to Bactrim often to, due to the ability to cover MRSA infections. Also, it's, it's a daily, uh, twice a day dosing, which seems to be easier. Um, so that tends to be my go to medication. I know I think a lot of you will use dicloxacillin. Um, or Keflex. Um, so usually by the time patients come to me, they've tried these and are not working, and so I switch to to Bactrim. Um, importantly, in nursing, when there's mastitis, we want to think about discouraging nipple shields and discouraging pumping. It seems like that would make things better for the discomfort, but actually, it's not going to improve the infectious causes. It's going to make things worse. In addition, sunflower lecithin is very useful in decreasing viscosity of milk. Um, and then what we've known also is phlegmons that require a much longer course of antibiotics, up to 30 days. Okay. Um, certainly, I, I don't, I can't see questions. If there are questions, you can certainly stop me um, and ask a question. I know I'm going quite fast, and I know there's just so much information to cover, um, and it's a so I don't mind being interrupted. Please feel free to interrupt me if you need to. Okay. Um, cysts are basically just fluid-filled sacs. They are most commonly seen in pre uh, premenopausal women, um, often related to menstrual cycles. They can be really big and have no symptoms. They can be very small and have symptoms. Um, so we typically don't need to go and aspirate each one of these, but if there's one causing symptoms, it's a very simple thing to do a needle aspiration. So many times I'll see patients go get their imaging, they'll get their uh, diagnosis of a cyst because of some breast pain and a lump, but then nothing will be done. You know, you, you can go and say, even the radiologist says, okay, there's a cyst and that's it. But the, it's the ordering physician, often it's the gynecologist who needs to say, okay, well, we have a cyst, probably the one causing your pain. 
now go back and get it aspirated. Um, sometimes you do need that extra step of actually asking for and ordering the aspiration. It's not always going to come from the radiologist as a possibility. Um, but it's really hard to get rid of cysts. Um, they tend to come back. You've got to caution patients of, okay, well, it's a tiny needle to drain the cyst, but it possibly could come back. Um, and we typically don't excise these anymore. They just leave uh, surgical scars and you're going to have possibly other cysts coming up. Okay, going to fibroadenoma. So these are benign lesions. They are lumps, solid masses. They are in the spectrum of fibroepithelial neoplasms. So they come from the stroma. They grow as a solid growth and they usually look very smooth on imaging with smooth borders, sometimes lobulated borders. They tend to um, show up in younger women, but they can be very small and they can be very big. Often we can observe these and the current guidance is to observe them if they're under two centimeters, especially if they're not causing symptoms. But if they are very large or growing um, or causing symptoms, then we talk about surgical excision. Again, this is something your radiologist will say, okay, there's a smooth benign lesion. It looks like a fibroadenoma. They can either follow up or it's too small to worry about and no follow up needed. But in the meantime, the patient's sitting there with pain and it's, it, it's on the gynecologist or the ordering physician to say, okay, you have a fibroadenoma. There's a reason why you're having that discomfort. Go see the surgeon now. Often the radiologist will not say this needs to be excised. It's on the shoulders of the ordering physician to decide whether that's clinically important or not. Under a microscope, it's really easy to see these. So they certainly can be biopsied if a patient is wondering, are you sure it's benign? Are we sure it's not cancerous? Um, but there's other management of fibroadenomas. Um, there are some studies looking at ultrasound guided percutaneous excision. So you use a very large or um, core needle and smaller fibroadenomas can be excised like that with a core needle excision. You just take the core all around the fibroadenoma and remove it. And then cryoablation is something I've, I've also done. It's um, basically freezing the tumor in vivo. Uh, does leave a mass and that mass takes about six months to absorb. But for smaller fibroadenomas, again, usually under um, two centimeters or less, uh, freezing works very well. Unfortunately, insurance is not covering cryoablation, so it's a cost to the patient, but sometimes that's um, optimal to patients um, as a, instead of an incision and a small procedure under anesthesia. For phyloides tumors, this is also in the spectrum of fibroepithelial neoplasms. These we tend to excise due to the possible rapid growth and possible conversion to malignancy. We used to say we needed a very large margin around these with a one centimeter margin around the tumor um, to assure it's not going to come back. But there has been a very big paradigm shift with phyloides tumors to allow for just a simply clear margin um, around the ink to not um, have to re-excise additional benign breast tissue. So these definitely, no matter what the size, we do want to excise them. Um, and then the next, uh, Topic we're going to look at is PASH, so pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia. This I get a lot of referrals for. Does it need to be excised? This was the biopsy. Under a microscope, it's very easy to tell whether or not this is a true angiosarcoma, or it's a mesenchymal lesion coming from the myofibroblast. It's easy to distinguish under a microscope for pathologists, but on imaging and sometimes even on exam, these look very concerning. It's no wonder many of them get biopsied because they show abnormal features. They're not smooth and lobulated. Sometimes they're palpable. Um, so you can typically uh, um, not excise these and that's the current guidance is to not remove them. But that's a little bit of a discussion with patients on, are you willing to deal with the palpable finding? Are we comfortable with the biopsy? So there are some exceptions to when we need to remove this, but often we really don't need to remove Cash or pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia. Atypia, however, uh, as you all would know, is uh, ductal hyperplasia and it's atypical. It's thought to be a precursor to ductal carcinoma in situ. And it's very difficult sometimes to distinguish between this and true ductal carcinoma in situ. So we do recommend excision and even uh, chemoprophylaxis, meaning with tamoxifen sometimes in patients who have this lesion. 
this is a high risk lesion. And recently at one of our tumor boards, our pathologist made this slide for us because it was very difficult to determine um, from this patient's biopsy if she had atypia or DCIS. And she'd tell, so ductal carcinoma in situ is basically stage zero breast cancer, whereas atypical ductal hyperplasia is stage minus one. So what we're talking about under a microscope, they look very similar. And the difference really is, um, as you can see on the far right, low grade DCIS is when you have these atypical cells covering two millimeters or more involving greater than two ducts. So you could have one millimeter of it and one duct or one millimeter and two ducts, and it's called atypical ductal hyperplasia. So just a hair fraction difference from calling this stage zero breast cancer. And, and the converse is also true, uh, usually able, easily able to tell about um, usual ductal hyperplasia. So you will see those words on a biopsy report as well. A patient had a mass, they had a biopsy, it shows ductal hyperplasia. That's not atypia. And the way we can tell is from the stains on the bottom. So CK56 is not seen in usual ductal hyperplasia. Uh, sorry, it's not seen at all in atypia or DCIS. There's usually a mosaic pattern in ductal hyperplasia. On the, on the converse, um, we see a lot of ERPR positivity in ADH and DCIS. So under a microscope, this is what our pathologists are looking for. Is it DCIS or not? And is it ductal hyperplasia or low grade DCIS or atypical ductal hyperplasia? It's a very fine line. You can look at studies of, you know, they, when they take 10 pathologists in a room, they show them the same slides and there's a 50% concordance rate. It's, it's very challenging for us to figure this out sometimes. So they always need to be excised, um, the atypia and the DCIS. The usual ductal hyperplasia, however, is only a risk factor. Um, but here you can see the strong ERPR positivity staining in atypia and how this actually looks very much like DCIS. Lobular carcinoma in situ is sort of the opposite. Still a very high risk for breast cancer, but we don't need to cut it out. Um, it's in the lobules of the breast, uh, not the ducts, but um, it can be associated with an increased risk of bilateral breast cancer. Often we talk about getting MRIs. With classical lobular carcinoma in situ, the upgrade rate, meaning cutting it out and looking is there cancer, is so low we tend to talk about not cutting it out, not surgically excising it. Pleomorphic lobular carcinoma in situ, though, this is showing necrosis and signet ring formation, is a much higher risk of finding associated invasive lobular carcinoma. Those we tend to want to excise. We still do not treat this as an, a stage zero breast cancer, though, meaning we don't offer radiation. In DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ, we do treat with lumpectomy, radiation, and endocrine blockade. With LCIS and pleomorphic LCIS specifically, we can offer lumpectomy. We typically will not be radiating this. We do not actually need a negative margin of this um, on pathology. And we sometimes offer chemoprophylaxis. For these patients, we often talk about breast MRI for screening due to their higher risk of breast cancer. Radial scar is another really challenging finding on imaging. It looks like a speculated mass. It looks like cancer. It always tends to get biopsied and people tend to be very concerned by the finding on imaging. But under a microscope, it looks like a complex sclerosing lesion, meaning a scar um, within the breast tissue. It is not cancerous, but about 10 to 25% of these will have associated ductal carcinoma in situ. So the, the guidance is to excise all radial scars Certainly gives me peace of mind because they look so concerning on imaging, but I've seen enough times when I cut this out and there's some DCIS there that it's an interesting um, pathology, uh, certainly. So this does need to be excised um, as a routine. Now, as part of it, one of the hats I wear is um, I'm on the American Society of Breast Surgeons Research Committee. So we come up with not only the, the research studies to share with the membership, but also our consensus guidelines. Consensus guidelines get reviewed every couple of years due to all of the new data. But if we look at this long list of um, non-cancerous but high-risk lesions, 
the guidance is um, got two columns. So we have the lesion on the left, the recommendation on the right, and then all of the exceptions. Each patient is going to have a different reason for doing each thing. Atypical ductal hyperplasia, we usually want to cut out. But there's an exception for that, and that is if it's a very small lesion that's been cut out, patient doesn't want surgery, fine. You have an 85-year-old with a five-year life expectancy, but they still got a mammogram, they still got a biopsy, they found some atypia, maybe you want to watch that for a little while. LCIS and atypical lobular hyperplasia, we don't typically excise this, but we think about excising it. If there's the discordant pathology, or if there's not enough sampling, like you feel like the lesion wasn't fully sampled well enough, that biopsy clip isn't in a good position, um, some of the lesion may have been missed. Pleomorphic lobular carcinoma in situ is that more aggressive looking LCIS under a microscope. We do want to remove that. Um, pure flat epithelial atypia or also a columnar cell change. Those are another two lesions you're going to see under a microscope, we don't have to remove all of those. We tend to often go and remove flat epithelial atypia because of the word atypia, but it is worth having a conversation with a patient. Okay, do I need to cut this out? Or no, I really want it out. Please don't leave it in me. Um, so patients will kind of guide you a little bit to that decision-making process. Capillary lesions usually need to be excised. Um, and I, I didn't get into it, but I have a few slides on this, um, but there are plenty of studies looking at when can we not cut out papillary lesions. And then there's a whole spectrum of papillomatosis and hundreds of papillomas showing up in a breast. And do we need to remove each of those? So those are going to be case by case, but typically we do recommend excision due to the increased upstaging of a finding of a papillary carcinoma. Complex sclerosing lesions is the same as radial scar. So sometimes we forget that. Sometimes a pathologist will write radial scar and you're like, oh yeah, I know that's supposed to come out. Sometimes a pathologist will list complex sclerosing lesion um, as the finding. And that is the radial scar that we just talked about. Fibroadenomas, we talked about some guidance on when and where, where to cut them out. Fibroepithelial lesions or possibility of phy phyloides tumors we want to usually remove. And then mucosal lesions, desmoid tumors, and PASH, there's a lot of variety there. Um, desmoid tumors we do excise, but the others are really, um, can be case by case. Okay, going to nipple discharge. So on the left, we have pictures of a nipple up close showing um, multiple ducts discharging multiple types of fluid. Creamy fluid, green cloudy fluid, brown fluid, all of those individually and together are benign discharge. So benign discharge is gonna be from multiple ducts. It's gonna be often um, looking like this, one or all of the others, um, and then um, sometimes from both breasts and both nipples. Benign, uh, so non-benign discharge is gonna be on the right, a, a bloody discharge. So I don't recommend needing to do a hemocult for all discharge just to make sure there's no blood. If you squeeze on a nipple hard enough, you will get some blood on your hemocult. Um, true blood, you usually can tell. We're not worried about a little bit of brown coloration, but when it's blood like that, that's a concern. Um, so we're worried about non-spontaneous, meaning it happens on their bra, their bra. They see discharge on their bra, their bra is getting wet. It happened in the shower. They were showering, they used a little bit of soap, and they noticed some discharge coming up. Um, but non-spontaneous discharge, meaning they're compressing the breast to get the discharge out, or they were somehow they squeeze them, they're on their own, or there's multiple ducts bilateral, or the colors of green, brown, creamy, white. Those are not discharges we need to worry about so much. It's a lot of reassurance um, for the patient. I would have to say, uh, just going back to that, um, management for that is number one, well, Stop pushing on your nipple. Number two, use a warm compress. Don't clog the duct with um, topical creams and ointments. I found people using all kinds of butters and oils on their breasts, and that will clog the ducts and cause some backup in the cysts within the duct. So the duct is supposed to ex you know, expel and express 
fluid, but if you clog that duct, you'll get a backup and the opposite can happen as well. Um, so the, the, care, the kind of discharge we care about is gonna be the kind that happens without pressure. Bloody discharge is very important, but papillomas can also cause a clear discharge. So that's also something we don't always read about. It's not just bloody discharge, but single duct. So one spot of clear discharge, totally see-through, not white, not yellow, but clear is another kind of discharge I care about. That's going to suggest an underlying papilloma or malignancy of capillary carcinoma can also form these. So we do wanna be very careful with the, uh, working this up with diagnostic mammogram ultrasound, and often you're gonna to wanna to plan on an MRI. If you find a bloody nipple discharge and you find a lesion that's causing it, that's great. Sometimes you won't find a lesion on imaging and you'll say, okay, there's still this bloody discharge. What do we do now? Get that MRI. Because so many uh, times we'll see something very far in the breast, not behind the nipple and distal and only seen with MRI. That's the cause of that bloody discharge. Sometimes we'll see a whole a elongated duct that can't be seen easily with imaging because it's just a microscopic duct, but that whole duct is full of malignancy and you'll see that on MRI. Sometimes we don't even see that on our MRI and then we're like, okay, all the imaging we've done is normal. You still have this. What do we do? You send them to a breast surgeon at that point because what we can do um, is we do what's called a central duct exploration. So we take them to the OR and we find the duct that's discharging I usually place a lacrimal probe through the duct um, that's discharging when they're asleep. So this is much nicer than uh, doing ductoscopy and something awake with a galactogram. Um, I think that's a little bit of torture to a woman's breast. It can be done certainly, but you're still not going to treat the cause. So I tend to skip those galactograms or um, it, which is done awake with a radiologist looking through the nipple, they injected contrast, they take x-rays, but that's with the patient awake. I think that's somewhat uncomfortable. You can diagnose something, but you're not gonna be able to treat it. But when we do a central duct exploration, we, we, um, we cannulate the duct that's discharging. We follow that duct till there's a blockage and then the probe cannot be passed any further. We make an incision around the areola and then we take out the blocked duct all the way to the base of the nipple. And that duct gets removed um, in block. We typically tie it off and sent to pathology. Many times we'll find a papillary lesion within that duct that's just too small to be picked up on, um, on um, imaging. So we do wanna care about this and we do not, we do not wanna just leave it alone at, okay, we can't find anything on imaging. There's still something that can be done. Most of these neoplasms, um, papillary lesions will be benign. And so you have to start wondering, do we really need to cut out all papillomas so there's some nipple discharge? Um, years ago, I did a, a study looking at which papillomas will be malignant and which will not. The study's been repeated about 10 more times, and each time we find that most of them are going to be benign, but there's still an upgrade rate of 10 to 50 percent, depending on the study. We see an upgrade more likely when there's any atypia associated with a papilloma and when there's an, a postmenopausal woman with that papilloma. We also find an upgrade rate with palp palpable papillary neoplasm. So papillomas will be, excuse me, the most common cause of nipple discharge, but they often don't cause nipple discharge if they're distal in the breast and not near the nipple. So central papillomas won't cause discharge, but they can be found on imaging. We typically cut them out. We typically make sure there's no underlying malignancy because of the upgrade rate, um, but sometimes they can be observed. So if you have a much older woman, no atypia in the papilloma, it was a couple millimeters in size, um, and that woman does not want to undergo surgery, then you just have her undergo close surveillance. Okay. Now, um, accessory breast tissue is something we all have seen in our uh, clinical practices. So many times women are embarrassed to talk about it. So many times um, I've found our, our clinicians and practitioners uh, avoid the topic and don't even talk about, oh, it's nothing, it's just some fat, it's just breast tissue, don't worry about it. So our breasts evolve embryologically just as um, dogs will. So uh, multiple nipples along the nipple crest ridge, the mammary crest, most of those involute before um, birth. But sometimes we get additional nipples along the nipple line or additional breasts in the armpit region um, or just accessory breast tissue in the axillary fold. 
Um, it's all normal, but we can actually develop breast cancer in these regions. Um, it's rare, but it can happen since it's actually the same breast tissue. Many women will describe not having this until pregnancy, until the hormonal experience that their bodies that have had, and then all of a sudden now they have extra tissue in their armpit all of a sudden, or an extra breast growing within their armpit. And that tissue tends to be very tender. Often it doesn't go away completely after um, postpartum years, and it stays with them. And with their next pregnancy, it often it comes up as a problem again. Often this can even happen, not with the first pregnancy, but with the second pregnancy. Um, and a woman can be very concerned about it. Certainly, it's it's very safe to reassure them that this is likely just normal accessory breast tissue, um, but it can become cosmetically disfiguring. You know, and you know you'll see women saying they are embarrassed to wear tank tops, they're embarrassed to wear bathing suits, um, and they don't even know how to talk about it. They're so embarrassed by this. So it can be removed. It can be surgically excised. Typically, it's a, a fairly broad incision under the armpit, but it can be hidden. Um, sometimes a combination of surgical excision and liposuction is needed. Um, but again, do, do examine these um, on your own clinical exams because again, it can, it can develop breast cancer. If it's breast tissue, you can get breast cancer. We've seen accessory breast tissue all the way to the upper for upper arm with breast cancer in it. Um, so you, you wouldn't, and you don't screen that, right? There's no mammogram for the arm. There's no mammogram for the upper abdomen if there's a breast tissue there. So please do a very careful clinical exam. Make sure there's nothing funny felt in there. We could obviously, you know, offer an ultrasound if there's something concerning, but um, we typically don't routinely screen accessory breast tissue for breast cancer, but you do want to think about a clinical exam for it. This is the been the bane of my existence lately. I'm on a, the board for the granulomatous mastitis committee, which I wish I, I wasn't, but somebody needs to do this um, in terms of figuring out how to best treat granulomatous mastitis. So this turns up as what can be looking like an abscess, what can be feeling like a very concerning cancer on imaging looks very concerning sometimes for a big cancer sometimes in women. Um, it looks like it could just be an abscess, so people stick needles in them and prescribe antibiotics. But what we see under a microscope is very different. It's not cancer, and it's not infectious typically, but sometimes it is. So what we're trying to figure out is how to treat this. Um, we think it's autoimmune and idiopathic. We see this in younger women after childbearing typically. It feels again just like an abscess or a cancer. It can be associated with enlarged lymph nodes. So often I'll have patients with lymph node uh, biopsy and uh, biopsy from this, um, showing a very uh, intense inflammatory process, sometimes necro necrotized, non necrotizing granulomas and lobules. So under a microscope, we know what this is. Pathologists can say, oh, that's what it is. We see it, but then we know, we're left with what do we do? Um, in the beginning, this used to get cut out all the time because people didn't know what to do. Antibiotics weren't working. Um, it seemed to be causing some drainage on the skin. Sometimes there'd be purulence that looked like purulence, actually. And so they'd be cut out and drained, but that tends to make it worse, not better sometimes. Um, so we often will go to anti-inflammatories and suppressing the immune system. NSAIDs are used, oral steroids are used, methotrexate needs to be used in some cases for, these can take um, sometimes a year to resolve. So this is a really challenging thing, not only to diagnose and deal with, but both for the patient and the clinician to manage. Um, right now, we've got a working group looking at how, how um, the Society of Breast Surgeons are trying to manage this. Um, we're looking at using intralesional steroids as well as topical steroids. Um, we found women just, you know, this is a, a about a sometimes a one to two year course of treatment with oral steroids and then methotrexate, which, as you can imagine, as a young woman is miserable just to treat something on the breast. So many times um, they say, please just cut it out. We go and cut it out, but it can come back and it can come back in the other breast and it can come back in the same spot. And um, so we, we don't wanna keep operating on these patients if we can help it, but the oral steroids tends to, to also be uh, very debilitating for patients. So we're looking at using intralesional steroids 
um, with or without topical catalog. Um, there's one really great study recently published showing success rate with no surgeries at one year follow up of these patients. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a learning curve, it's definitely a process for patients, but it's a management of expectations between both the clinician who's frustrated that this isn't working yet, this isn't getting there, let's just cut it out. Um, because we're really good at cutting it out, but that's not the answer. Um, and then the expectation of the patient of why, why isn't this gone yet? I can't deal with this anymore. It hurts, it's draining, it's messy, it's um, you know, interfering with my life, it's interfering with you know, my bedroom life, nothing is working for me. It's very difficult to manage. So we have to help manage the expectations, but know that this is a very long road to, to handle. Again, looks like an abscess, is not an abscess. I often will start with antibiotics in some cases because we just don't know what we're dealing with. Sometimes antibiotics are needed. They can get super infected, but typically that's not the only answer. Okay, diabetic mastopathy is similar. It looks scary on imaging. It's a mass, it's not malignant. Um, we tend to need to cut these out, but we don't need to cut them out. Um, they feel like a mass, so they seems like you need to remove this. But if you have a type one diabetic who's been type one diabetic for a long time, and you have a biopsy, you do want to biopsy these. Biopsy showing what this is under a microscope, you know you can actually just sit back and watch this and reassure the patient rather than cause scars and more problems because they do, they can also recur. This is less commonly seen than granulomatous mastitis, I think, um, depending on obviously your patient population. So again, on imaging, it looks very scary, but on a biopsy, it's very classic. Okay. So things we try to get out to the community about choosing wisely. Um, five things we want to think about um, for physicians should and shouldn't do. We don't want to routinely excise PASH. Um, we don't want to routinely excise biopsy-proven fiber adenomas that are under two centimeters in size. So we wait for symptoms. We wait for it to grow at least three centimeters. Um, I didn't get it about get into about what we do for abscesses, but we don't want to cut them out or drain them openly. We want to drain them with a needle. And at least two attempts with a needle rather than putting a big scar on a woman's breast, usually aspiration and antibiotics is enough. Um, don't do mammograms, please, in women with a less than five year life expectancy. You're going to find things that are probably going to be clinically not important for those five years of their life. And then we don't need to drain every cyst unless they're painful uh, or growing. We don't need to drain them. I'm going to skip the slides on breast cancer. It's hard. I know that uh, there's so many things to talk about today. We're already near our end. I did want to, um, you know, try, try to get these really important daily issues out there. I wanted to leave you with my cell phone number and my email because I know um, you're going to come up with questions later and feel free to, to call or text or email. Um, a very quick question of, oh, should I cut this out? What am I supposed to do about this? And I'm happy to text you back. That's what all the gynecologists out here tend to do regularly. Uh, thank you for listening. I guess we have about five or six minutes for questions. Thank you so much um, for that lecture. That was very helpful. Um, I just wanted to clarify quickly. So you said with the accessory um, breast tissue, um, is ultrasound really going to be the first imaging uh, modality if there is something concerning? Um, I think it would be because you can't easily squish a, that part of the breast with mammography. You know, it's going to be really challenging. Um, so ultrasound is the, the easiest thing to do to look. Um, and typically there's not going to be anything concerning really, really rare. I think only once have I seen a cancer with an accessory breast tissue, um, in my career. So it's going to be rare, but definitely think about it and do the exam and, and have patients be mindful. Ultrasound can be done on almost any body part. So yeah, that would be the best. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I was wondering, um, there's been some discussion regarding when you do a 3D mammogram. In a person who has dense breasts, let's say specifically dense, high, extremely dense breasts, whether they should be getting an ABUS, a screening ultrasound at the same time. 
And I mean, I've had patients where I've had the radiologist find something on that ultrasound, but sometimes it's an argument to get it. Is there a consensus on that or data in terms of yes or no? Um, I will tend to get it if they have, especially if they have enough risk. So I do this risk assessment. The consensus right now is looking at um, screening for risk risk associated screening within the breast surgical community, meaning, you know, you do this risk calculation, at least at a minimum, what's their age and what's their family history? If nothing else, at least those two categories, you know, if they're, you know, 50 or perimenopausal um, or older with extremely dense breast tissue, please add the uh, screening ABUS. Um, automated breast ultrasound is what you're referring to. ABUS is good, but I actually prefer handheld ultrasound. It obviously depends on what your institute is allowing for. Um, some of them will not do the handheld um, breast ultrasound. As far as the breast society goes, we don't say you have to do um, a screening ultrasound as a routine for that category for extremely dense breasts. But mammogram is really not going to pick up most cancer in that breast. So you have to have to know that. And you have to tailor it to, well, is this patient able to get breast cancer? They're only 30 or they're 40 and they have extremely dense breasts. Do we always need to do it every year? It's really still um, a patient by patient, age by age, you know, managing the risk and expectations kind of thing. Um, still, we don't say don't do the mammogram to be very clear. We still want the mammogram, even in the extremely dense category for breast, because we can still find calcifications. We can still see asymmetry and we can still compare year to year. Is there a change within the parenchyma that's causing some distortion? Um, so we still get that mammogram. It's still going to be very useful to pick up DCIS or something early. Um, but I would prefer if it's a woman that can get breast cancer. Um, and they care to catch that breast cancer and be a little bit more aggressive than just the minimum, get that screening ultrasound in every BIRADS for extremely dense breast. I think eventually we'll have some guidelines to that, but again, like I said, it's really gonna manage on the, the age. You know, you're gonna really look for that in an 85-year-old, or are you gonna look for that in the 35-year-old? What's the right group to do that? And then we, we don't have the data for it. The data does show that it picks up too many benign things. That's the data right now. And that's so the it, I we guess have. to to just reiterate, so it is not um, um, wrong to get the screening uh, ultrasound when you have are doing a new 3D mammogram. You can do both of those. The 3D mammogram does not negate the need for the ultrasound. That's the discussion. Definitely not. Okay. I would definitely say do both of them if they want to do it once a year only. You know, one imaging modality once like one one screening. Once a year, do both at the same time. You know they're extremely dense. Get both of them. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Kapoor. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to leave your uh, phone number and your email, but I, I think if you did, I missed it. I was watching it throughout. Sure. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. It was in the upper right. <laughs> That's right. I'll put it in right now. There we go. Well, the breast cancer would be a whole nother hour to 10 hour lecture. So maybe in the future we can talk about that. There's certainly a lot of updates. Questions. All right, thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. That was excellent. Thank you.